Hey guys, sorry, I'm trying to get up and running here. Okay, good. We're we are live. All right. Been a very difficult weekend. My server has been going down all weekend, and I don't know why. I have a web developer working on it right now, but it's just been a weekend. So if you if you had trouble accessing the course or the um, main website, that's why the server is having issues. All right. Okay, so over the weekend, you guys had chapters five and six to do. Everybody read chapters five and six and take the tests in the white book. Okay, have you been doing the tests in the white book? Yep. Page 132, 130. Okay. Okay. Because you. I've been watching you too. Okay. Because you don't need um the the oh I just do it for to... yeah that that's an additional study, yeah, but okay. Okay. All right, Stephanie, how did you do on chapter five? Micaiah. Okay, in chapter six. Too wrong. Okay. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Nerlene. Okay, so you missed one on just number five. You missed 10, okay. All right, Alexa. Okay, and do you have chapter four? Hmm, I don't know that one. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so chapter four was a hundred. Okay, Brianna. Okay, I actually need one through four from you okay. as well. Uh, chapter four, I, I missed um, three. I got a hundred on three, two, and one. Very good. And on the front of your yellow book is a number. It's Y something. Y4. Y4. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any questions on what you read? Any questions on what you read? Chapter five or six? Five is important. You will have a lot of dementia patients. Um, so learning how to work with dementia patients is important. So chapter five is probably one of the most important, excuse me, important chapters in the book. All right. So we're going to do a really quick review here just to make sure because it's Monday and we're past the halfway point now. So just to make sure that we remember everything that we have learned so far. So how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan. And so that means that we can't add to or change anything. We have to read the instructions and follow them. Um, what are we observing for while we're doing the skills on the care plan? Anything, yeah, abnormalities, changes, pain, anything, anything that jumps out at, at us. And what do we do with those observations? Tell the nurse, we're going to report them. Every skill starts with an opening. What does every opening start with? A knock. Uh, when you knock, what do you need to do with the patient? What, what do we need to know about the patient? Yeah, we have to get them to identify themselves. Yes. Um, can we use sweetie, honey, love, anything like that? Okay. We're going to introduce ourselves two ways. What two things do they need to know about us? Name and title. Very good. Very good. 
Okay. Um, we're going to describe the skill because we want to get what from the patient? What do, what do we need from them? Permission. Very good. Once we get that permission, we're going to close the curtain. And then what's our very next action after we touch that curtain? Wash our hands. After we have washed our hands, we're going to go gather the supplies because you have to have clean hands to get clean supplies, but you need a place to put them. So we're gonna use a barrier. Yeah, that barrier provides a clean area to place our clean supplies. And we only wanna to touch our supplies with clean hands. Oops. Um, we don't wanna let the supplies touch your uniform. And we're gonna get the barrier when? when? When do we get the barrier? After we get our supplies? Before. All right. So when we're getting supplies, we have to decide whether we need gloves. And there's three rules that we look at. If we're going to touch any body fluids, any personal skin, or any non-intact skin, we need gloves. What's the first thing those gloves should touch though? The patient. And if we use gloves, we have to be aware of what the dirty gloves touch to help prevent cross-contamination. And then we're going to remove those gloves correctly. We have to decide whether we're gonna use a privacy blanket. The privacy blanket actually has two purposes. It's to keep the patient private or covered, yes. I mean, that's in the name, but yes, warm is the other reason, that's right. <laughs> so we're gonna use a privacy blanket anytime a patient is uncovered or undressed, either way. Um, we're not gonna just take the sheet down and put the blanket on. We have to do it in a way that the patient remains covered. So we're gonna put the blanket on on top of the sheet and pull the sheet underneath. Good? Okay. We also had, um, we've learned most of this, okay, linen rules. Um, linens can't touch your uniform. We already know that. And we must have clean hands to get linens. We already know that because that's part of barrier. Um, what can't we do to linens though? When we're putting linens on a, a bed or a surface, what, yeah, you don't want to snap them or shake them. And we don't want anything to touch the floor, clean or dirty. Um, unused items though, must be placed in dirty linen. So if you get a stack of washcloths and you don't use them all, we can't save them for later. You can't use them on another person and you can't put them back in clean supply. You have to dispose of them. So knowing how many supplies you need actually becomes pretty important. We also learned scoot and roll. So where does a patient need to be at all times in the bed? in the middle of the bed. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter whether they're laying on their back or their side, they have to be in the middle of the bed. If we are going to turn them, we wanna scoot them toward us before we turn them. But do we turn them toward us or away from us? Away, because we need to remain behind the patients behind. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the patient has to always be in the middle of the bed. That is a important, testing principle. So at the end of every skill, when you're doing the closing, you really do need to look at the patient. Are they in the middle of the bed? Are they safe? Are they comfortable? You need to kind of take a, a minute to actually look at them. Don't get so caught up in your steps that you forget why we're doing those steps. Anything that uh, needs to be washed is going to follow washing rules. And the first washing rule is that we don't add soap to the basin. Yeah. And that's because whatever we wash, we rinse. And whatever we rinse, we... What do you do when you get out of the shower? Dry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we're getting water for a patient to use on a patient, can we touch faucet? So what do we need? Paper towel, turn the faucet on. We're gonna feel the water temperature. It should feel warm. Who else has to check it? The patient. 
Um, you don't want to try not to get your surface wet, whether it's table, floor, bed, whatever. So we're going to use something to protect the surface, barrier, towel, something. Um, and then if we're going to put lotion on, what do we have to do with the lotion first? And then what do we have to do after? Wipe off the excess. All basins are cleaned the same way. For the test, we simply rinse it, dry it and store it, but you do need a paper towel to put it away because remember you haven't washed your hands yet. And then all skills end with the closing. Now the closing, there's six C's to the closing. Um, we want to make sure the environment is clean. We have to ask the patient if they're comfortable and we're gonna address that emotional comfort as well. We can ask about a magazine or something like that. Um, yeah, well, I was just going to say, when it comes to comfort, you can also offer to adjust the head of the bed, but the entire bed needs to be in what position? Yeah, the lowest possible position. So the head of the bed is always under that comfort setting, right? So whatever's comfortable for them. But the entire bed, that safety, that has to be all the way down to the floor. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have a clean environment. We have comfort. We're going to give them a... What do we need to give them before we leave the room? If they have a problem, yeah, call light. And then we're going to open the curtain. Once you've done all those things, what do you want to do? Yeah, clean your hands. And then if charting is required, you're going to wash your hands after you chart. Good? Questions? All right. So when we were doing mouth care, what position does patient need to be in? Yeah, fully upright. We want to protect the clothing. We want to brush all surfaces of the teeth and the tongue. We want to... What do we need to do with the toothbrush before we put toothpaste on it? Yeah, you need to wet it. And then um, once you brush somebody's teeth, they have to be able to, yeah, rinse and spit, absolutely. But because they've rinsed and spit, they're going to have toothpaste and water and stuff all over their face. So what do you want to do before we end the skill? Yeah, clean them up. Make sure that they're clean and dry. Okay. Um, dressing a resident. What do we need to ask them? What, what, can, what do they have the right to do? Yeah, they get to choose their own clothing. Absolutely. Um, when do we want to get the clothing? Before or after we undress them? Why? Yeah, it reduces the amount of time they're exposed. Absolutely. When we lift an extremity, we always lift from below. Yep, and we're going to support those joints. Um, how do we know which arm to undress first? Not the weak. Nope. No, the arm strong arm. Yep. USA first. Undress strong arm first. USA first. And then we're going to dress that weak arm first, which is where you were thinking, I think. <laughs> All right. We don't want to overextend or force movement. And where do the dirty items go? In the hamper. When we leave the patient for this skill, it's going to tell us they have a weak arm because it's the whole point of this, right? So where does the call light go at the end of the skill? In the stronger arm. Very good. When we're taking a pulse, do you want the arm just hanging out there? No. Midair? So the arm always has to be supported. Um, pulses are always reported over what period of time? Okay, let me rephrase this a little bit. Um, if I give you a pulse, uh, if I tell, tell you a patient has a pulse of 64, that means the heart beats 64 times a minute. So pulses are always reported over a minute. Okay, make sense? All right. Um, what do we use to uh, find the pulse? Do we use our thumb? Okay, and you want to use the tips, not the flat areas. What's a normal pulse rate? Oh. 
you got the numbers right, just the way you said it was not. So it's 62, 100. The only time we use that word over is for blood pressure, not for pulse. So 62, 100 is normal. Um, right, where's the radial pulse located? Where's the radial pulse located? When we're finding a pulse, where are we? Okay, at the top of the thumb side of the wrist. Um, remember that we have to say out loud, start and stop. So the evaluators start counting when we do and stop counting when we do. And how many evaluators do we count with in Florida? Two, yeah. What's the very last thing that we have to do with this skill? If we count something, what do we have to do with that? Yeah, document. So if we document, what do we have to do after we document? Hands. So hand and nail care. Again, we're gonna support that. You seeing a trend here? <laughs> support the wrist and arm at all times. Um, we wanna soak the hand in water, whatever we wash, we, what do we do before we dry? Rinse, then dry. Um, make sure the hand is on a towel or something soft, right? Um, which edge of the orange stick do we use to clean under the nails? The pointy end or the slanted end? Slanted end. And what do we wanna do when we go from one nail to the next? You wanna take dirt from one nail and put it under the other one? Yeah, we wanna wipe it off. We wanna use the MRE board to file in one direction toward the middle. Very good. And we're gonna apply lotion last. When we make an occupied bed, the patient needs to take up the least amount of space in the bed. So that means they need to be on their side. But where in the bed do they need to be on their side? In the middle. Very good. Very good. So clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. That's how we're going to change the sheets. Remember, clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. And what don't we want underneath the patient? Wrinkles. We'll make those hospital corners. And then we want to loosen the sheet over there. Yeah, their feet or their toes. We want to replace the pillowcase with the opening facing away from the door. All right, respirations are also reported over what period of time? One minute. What's our normal values for respirations? So 20 is the high end. What's the low end? 12, 12 to 20. And what don't you want to tell the patient? Yeah, you can't tell them you're counting their breathing because they'll start breathing funky and we're not going to get an accurate reading. Um, again, we want to say start and stop. And what counts as a cycle? What in inhaling, exhaling, both? What counts? What what are we counting here? Yeah. So in and out together count as one. So if you start on an inhale, you count it. If you start between inhale and exhale, you count it. If you start on the exhale, you count it because the whole thing counts as one, okay? <clears throat> Sideline position. We're gonna scoot the patient toward us and then which arm goes up? You guys remember? So I'm, I'm gonna give you a, not right and left, it's closest or furthest. Which one goes up? Closest arm, does the patient's closest arm to you go up or does the patient's furthest arm to you? The furthest arm goes up. What do we do with the closest arm? Well, we're, we're going to work on the knees, but the furthest arm goes up, closest arm crosses. Remember, so you look like this, okay? We're gonna bend the closest knee and angle the furthest one and then we'll roll the patient away from us. We wanna put a pillow behind their back. We're gonna put a pillow between their legs. We're gonna put a pillow under their 
arm and we're going to adjust the pillow under their head. Okay. Foot care. Again, we want to support the foot. You seeing a trend? <laughs> All right. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Where don't we want to put lotion? Between the toes. Why are we really there? Are we cleaning the foot or is that really why we're there? To look at the foot. So we want to observe for any red areas, abnormalities, sores, wounds, anything like that. Are we not because of the like the moisturizer because their skin does get dry. Right, moisturization, but the real reason, and, and that's a, a, an important step of what we're doing, but the real reason we're doing it is to look at the skin. <laughs> um, no bare feet on the floor. And once we're done cleaning the um, foot, we're going to replace the sock and we're going to remove any, well, we're putting a sock on. What do you want to make sure? Yeah, well, we would, yeah, we definitely would remove the lotion, Thank but we're, you. yeah, and remove the wrinkles from the sock. You don't want it all bunched up. Sure. Yep, and then we're going to apply that shoe and secure it properly. I have a quick question. Sure. Because, like, half, of, half of my clients have the hospital slippers they sit, socks that they wear, mm -hmm. so, especially my ones with dementia. Like they take, I take them to the bathroom before they get in the shower, and that's how, like, they have their socks on, have them sit down, take their socks off, and then get in the shower. So, I mean, does that count, at, or do they need shoes? You know what I mean? Because even in the hospital, they give you the slip resistant shoe, the slip resistant sock. They tell you to keep your shoes off if you don't want to get any, like, if your stuff that you walked all outside, everywhere. Okay. So, what kind of things might be on the floor of a hospital setting? Yeah, so blood needles. Okay, is it possible that patients might not make it all the way to the bathroom every time if yeah. they're sick or weak or whatever? Yeah. Okay, so we could have urine and feces and blood and vomit and all kinds of stuff. So these patients that are walking around in slipper socks and they get into bed, those slipper socks get into bed with them, right? So in a clinical setting, does that do anything to keep them safe? No. Okay. So we have to look at that from an infection control standpoint. Just because they're used in the hospital doesn't mean that that's the best solution. I don't because if you do like some of the nursing homes, I know the one that I worked like yesterday, that's what they tell you to put on their feet. If they don't want a lot of dementia patients don't want to wear their shoes. So they right. you want to offer them as good as they as good as you can because they already don't know where they are as is. Well, remember, you're going to follow the care plan for each individual patient, and the nurse is the one that's responsible for figuring out how to best accommodate that patient. So if that's what you're told to do with that patient, that's fine. But when we're talking about in generalities, slipper socks are not enough. Slipper socks don't protect against uh, injury at all. They are an infection control nightmare. Yeah, Right. So it's um, we have to think about it a little bit more um, critically than just okay. slipper socks for everything. Right. OK. Um, so when <laughs> we are assisting somebody with a bed can. Um, we have, what, what do we need to put under the bed pan? A barrier, a chucks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to put a chucks underneath the patient and then put the bed pan on top of the chucks. Then we're going to put the head of the bed. What do we need to do with that head of the bed? Up, right, because they have to be in a normal peeing position. 
we're going to give them a call light, some toilet paper, right? And then we're going to leave the area, but we're not leaving the room because we have no other patients. We don't need to wash our hands or anything like that. When they say they're done, we're going to go back in and we got to take that bedpan out. So are we going to touch that bedpan without gloves? So we need gloves on. We're going to take the bedpan and the chucks out all together. Why do we need the chucks? So any urine they get on the bed. Okay, so that's why the chucks is on the bed. When we take the whole thing out, though, we take the chucks with it. Why do we need to take the chucks and the bedpan together? Right, you can't carry an open container of human waste. Yep. So we need that chucks to cover our bedpan. Good. Make sense? All right. And then we're just going to take the bedpan over to the bathroom and empty it, dry it, and store it like we do everything else. But our care plan told us that the patient is able to wipe themselves. So we know that they've wiped themselves. What do they need to do after using the, the bedpan? Yes, yeah, so we have to give them a hand wipe. Don't forget that step for this particular skill. Giving them a hand wipe is pretty important. I do have a question. Sure. Okay, like when you're giving somebody a bath, like if you're giving them a full, like a full bath, gloves are best with like, I know even if they don't have, like, if their skin is fine and stuff like that, I still wear gloves. I mean, if I do that on the test, am I going to get, am I going to get fun? Well, we haven't gotten to partial bed bath yet. Okay. That's actually on the schedule for today. So okay. we're going to be talking about that. Um, but we're going to be touching personal skin, the breast area. So do we need gloves when we touch personal skin? So yes. I just I was like I thought I was like no don't dress so I got to put the gloves on. I know water gets in them and stuff like that. <laughs> right. So gloves are um, recommended because we are in personal areas. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any questions on the skills that we've learned so far? Okay. Let's go to page fifty six. I'm sorry, 55, Give me one second, guys. Okay. All right. So do you remember range of motion shoulder that we learned on Wednesday? You guys remember that range of motion shoulder? Well, this skill, range of motion, elbow and wrist, is very, very similar, just a different body part. So if you remember what we learned on Wednesday, flexion extension was up, down, abduction, adduction was side to side, and rotation was around. So what we need to do here is read the care plan and find out what body parts we're exercising, what exercises we're doing, and how many repetitions are needed. So if you look at the care plan at the top of page 55, it tells us to provide the following range of motion exercises to the resident's right elbow and right wrist, flexion extension. So that's it. We're just going up and down on the elbow and up and down on the wrist. It tells us to perform three repetitions of each exercise and the resident is not able to help with the exercises. So this is easy. We go up and down on the elbow three times. Guys, the elbow is a hinge joint. It only goes up and down. If you get an elbow to do anything other than this, you broke it, okay? It only goes up and down. 
The wrist, though, can go in all different direction. It can go up and down. It can go side to side. It can go around. It can do all kinds of stuff. But this care plan only tells us to do flexion extension or up down. So we're going to go up and down three times. So we're going to do an opening up and down of the elbow three times, up and down of the wrist three times, closing. That's the whole skill. I would want a range of motion skill for the test. They are the easiest skills that we do. All you have to do is read the care plan and follow it. Okay, good. Okay, so let me get somebody to come over here and lay down in the bed. And I will show you this particular skill. Pay attention to which body part the care plan is telling you to exercise. Remember, this one says right elbow and right wrist. So I've got to make sure that I'm on the correct side of the patient. If I do this skill completely properly, I do everything exactly right, but I've done it on the wrong body part, am I going to pass? Because I didn't follow the care plan. Starting to see how important that care plan is? Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your right elbow and wrist. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. I have clean hands. First thing I'm going to do is bend your arm up and back to the bed like you're making a, a muscle. Okay. So we're going to turn our hand palm up. We're going to go up and all the way back to the bed. That's one. Feel okay? Up, all the way back to the bed. That's two. Still good? Up, all the way back. Three. Good? Okay, so now we're going to make a loose fist, and we're going to bend the uh, wrist forward and back like you're revving a motorcycle. You should feel a little stretch. Back. Feel okay? This is two. Still okay? One more. Three. Very good. Are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Would you like a magazine before I go? Okay, here's your call light. If you need anything at all, let me know. I'm gonna open the curtain. My environment is clean. Wash my hands. Think about my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you. All right, any questions on range of motion? elbow and wrist. Any questions? I got a comment over here, guys. Let me just take a look. Anna, I will, um, I will answer that question at the end of class today. So stick around till the end and I'll give you your answer. All right. So a question I get asked a lot, let's go to page 47. A question I get asked a lot is, okay, but what if the patient says no? What if they don't want the skill done? What if I go into do range of motion and I tell them and they say, no, what, what do I do? But yeah, absolutely. All you have to do is tell the nurse. Now it is nice though, if you get more information, but you want to do it nice. So go, well, why not? I've got things to do and you're in my way. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to be nice about it, but you might want to say something like, can I ask why not? Are you not feeling well? Is this not a good time for you? get a little bit more information because when you go tell the nurse, hey, I went into do range of motion on Mr. Smith's right arm and he told me no, she's gonna ask you why, yeah. So she needs that information to work with. So if you can gather that information, it does help, okay? Sometimes it's just as simple as, well, my family's coming. I, you know, I don't wanna get into anything right now. I wanna visit with them. Well, that's easy fix, right? We just come back later and do it, but we still want to let the nurse know 
hey, I can't do range of motion right now. They got family visiting. I'll catch up with them in a little bit. Always let the nurse know what's happening because she doesn't know if, if you're not doing things as you're told to do them, what happens if your family have an emergency and you've got to leave the facility? Now we don't know what's been done and what hasn't. So we always want to work as a team, right? So remember, if the patient says no, we want to try to find out why nicely, get more information, and then just let the nurse know. So let's go to page 68. All right, so 68, our care plan at the top of the page tells us a resident with dentures is sitting at an overbed table with their dentures in a denture cup. Okay, so we've got somebody sitting in a chair at a table, dentures are out of their mouth in a cup. It tells us the resident's denture needs to be brushed with toothpaste and the resident needs mouth care. The denture is stored in a denture cup after cleaning. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth or denture care. So let's talk about dentures really quickly. So the first thing that you need to know is that when we're cleaning dentures, the dentures need to be cleaned, yes, but so does the mouth they came out of. And a lot of people focus on the dentures, they totally miss the mouth care part. Remember that the mouth has all that denture paste that holds the dentures in. And that holds food particles right up against the gums. That's not healthy. So we need to make sure that when we're cleaning dentures, the other half of this is to clean the mouth those dentures came out of. That way we don't end up with gum ulcers and bad breath and all those types of things. The other thing that you need to know is that dentures are always stored in water. They should never be um left out of water and that's because dentures aren't the same as your teeth you know that they, they they're not living tissue um dentures are like kind of like a resin and if they're not in fluid in liquid of some sort they become brittle and they can break so there's three different types of dentures. And uh, a lot of people don't, don't know this. We tend to think of dentures as this, a full plate. That's what you see here. And see, this is not in water. <laughs> That's what you see here. This is a full plate of dentures. This is what we tend to think about when we think about dentures. <laughs> this is a top plate. And I know it's a top plate, so it would go like this in, in the mouth. I know it's a top plate because it has an area that fits on the palate. A bottom plate won't have this area in the middle. It will just be more like a horseshoe. A bottom plate would look more like this. See how that's more of a horseshoe shape? Because there's a cutout for the tongue. Okay. So this would be top, this would be bottom. Now, why does this one have a bunch of holes in it? Remember I said this is a full denture plate, but if somebody still has good teeth, healthy teeth, we don't pull out healthy teeth in most cases. So we would create a partial that would have areas to fit around the patient's natural teeth, okay? So full plate, partial. And then sometimes we have little pieces of denture like this that would clip onto existing teeth. That would be a bridge. Sometimes bridges are implanted. They don't come out. Sometimes they do. Everybody um, has a little bit different way of dealing with their missing teeth. Good? So three different types of dentures, full plates, partials, and bridges. They're all cleaned the same way. Top plate will have a palate. Bottom plate will have an area cut out for the tongue. Dentures have to be stored in water. Now, 
the best way to clean dentures is with the little fuzzy or fizzy, not fuzzy, fizzy tablets where you put the dentures in a cup, fill it with cool water, drop a couple of denture cleaning tablets in there and let the tablets clean the dentures and then you just rinse them off, okay? That's how we prefer dentures to be cleaned most of the time. A lot of uh, denture care maker, you know, the people that make the dentures tell you not to brush dentures with toothpaste because toothpaste is abrasive and it can cause little cracks to form. Little cracks create warm, dark, moist places. So we're gonna follow the care plan. If the care plan tells us fizzy tablets, that's what we're going to use. If the care plan tells us toothpaste, that's what we're going to use. Good? Questions? So this care plan says our patient is sitting in a chair, their dentures are in a denture cup on the table, and it tells us to brush the dentures with toothpaste. So we're gonna brush them like regular teeth. Now, the reason that the dentures are out of the mouth and in a cup is because CNAs do not take dentures out and we do not put dentures in. The patient has to be able to do that on their own. If they can't, then we puree their food. We order a pureed diet, which means they don't have to chew a lot. We chop everything up for them, okay? So you don't take dentures out of somebody's mouth. You don't put dentures in somebody's mouth. So this skill starts with a patient sitting in a chair. They've already taken their dentures out and put them in the cup. Your job is to take them over to the sink, clean them, put them in clean water to store them, put them in a place that your patient can get to later if they want them, and then clean the mouth those dentures came out of. A couple of important points with this one, though. When we're cleaning dentures, this is gonna get really slippery. You've got gloves on, there's running water, there's toothpaste, dentures themselves can get very slippery. If those dentures fall into the sink, they're likely to break. So we wanna put something soft on the bottom of the sink like a washcloth. And if you get that washcloth over the drain, that's even better because it causes the water to pool up and it's less likely to break the dentures if they fall. Okay, so washcloth in the bottom. We want to use cool water, not hot. Cool water is what we're looking for here. And remember, your care plan may have you put fizzy tablets in the water, but not for the test. So the important points for this particular skill is that we're going to put the washcloth in the sink and use cool water. We're going to store the clean dentures in clean water. We want something under that this, you see how wet this cup is just from me pulling out the, this cup is going to get wet. If I left this wet cup on this table for a long time, what's going to happen to the surface of the table? Anybody know? Yeah, it's going to get wet. It's actually going to warp. Okay. So we need a, a coaster, basically, just a paper towel to, hold, uh, to uh, collect the water. Your patient must be sitting fully upright for mouth care. We're gonna protect the clothing. We're gonna brush all surfaces and the tongue. We'll wet all of our brushes before we apply the toothpaste. We're gonna to let the patient rinse and sit and leave the patient's face and clothing dry. So when you read this, notice that this is all that's really about the dentures. The rest of this is stuff we already know from mouth care. So this skill, you already know most of it. Cleaning the dentures is the only new part. So think of this as mouth care with an extra step. Okay, mouth care with an extra step. All right, so I'm gonna show you the video for this one because it has really good close-ups of cleaning the dentures. And then I have dentures here for you guys to be able to practice with. And if you remember, I told you that we'll have some practice time built into class today. So once I get done, we're already half done with the skills. We only have four skills to learn today and we've already got two of them behind us and it's not even 10 o'clock. So you will have some practice time today. This is one I definitely recommend that you practice in class. 
because you probably don't have dentures laying around at home to play with. However, if you um, if you want extra practice, right, and you can't come in here to practice for whatever reason, we have dentures here. But we also have a practice kit that has everything that you need to practice at home. It has bed pans and basins and emesis basin and orange stick and emery board, urinary drainage bag, graduate container. It even has a gate belt and it has dentures in it. They're not real, but <laughs> they're good. It allows you to be able to practice. All right, so let me turn the video on for you. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your senior mate today. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do denture care on you. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to take your dentures to the sink. I'm going to put a supply to the curtain and wash my hands. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place the barrier on the table so we have a clean area to place the clean supplies. And then I'll gather the supplies that I need. We'll need a cup of water, a tubette, a denture brush, toothpaste, a basin. A washcloth and a towel, and two sets of gloves. Okay, we're going to get the venture brush ready for use, so I'll wet it and apply a little bit of toothpaste to both sides. We'll allow the basin to hold that venture brush until we're ready to use it. I'll be right back, Mr. Jones. I'm going to go clean your dentures. Okay. I want to make sure that you're brushing all surfaces so you're getting all of the denture paste and the food particles off. Just make sure it's nice and clean. For the test, it's going to be a set of clean dentures. So just want to make sure you get all the surfaces.
can make that they're just going to set your ventures over here so that you have this and you can feed them later. Okay. I'll place the venture brush on the barrier and now we'll remove these slugs. Do you mind if I place a towel over your chest? Of course. will help keep your clothing clean. We're going to prepare for the mouth care portion of this skill. We'll take the toothpaste and wet it. Apply a little bit of toothpaste to one area of the toothpaste and apply gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to brush all surfaces of your teeth now. So in a moment, I'll need you to open your mouth wide so that I can reach the back teeth. Okay. Okay, so you open your mouth. Thank you. I'm going to brush the back on the bottom and on the top, both sides. So can you bring your teeth together, please? Thank you very much. We're going to throw the teeth out away. How much would you like to rinse? Would you like another rinse? Sure. Another rinse? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to remove your towel and we'll place this in 30 minutes. We'll throw away the disposables. And now I'm going to clean your basin. I'll be right back. Okay. Place the denture brush and the toothpaste in the basin and open the drawer with a paper towel. Store the basin and other supplies. I'll remove the barrier from the table and we'll throw this away as well. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, sir. Can I get you a magazine? No, thank you. Is there anything else that you need? No, sir. Your call light's right there. If you should need anything, just let me know. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps in my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Anybody have any questions on denture care? Any questions on denture care? <coughs> no? All right. Moving on. Ambulate with a gate belt. So this is on page 46 of your skills book. How do we know what to do with each patient? All right, this care plan at the top page 46 tells us to ambulate the resident at least 10 steps. That's five steps in one direction and five steps back. Remember, it's a return trip. For the test, they're actually gonna give you a um, destination. 
So they would say, walk to the desk and back or walk to the white table and back. They're going to give you a destination. You're going to follow the instructions they give you. Okay. Now, the problem here is that during the test, the reason that they're giving you that destination is during the test, before you ever get started with this particular skill, they're going to put something in your path. And they're going to tell you, walk the patient to the white table and back. They're looking to see, are you looking at the path before you scan the patient to make sure there's no obstacles? So what do you think you would need to do before you scan the patient? Yeah, that's going to be a graded checkpoint. So you have to make sure that you're looking for anything that uh, would cause your attention to not be on the patient during the walk. That's the whole point of this is they want to make sure that your attention is 100% on that patient. And the reason for that is that patients don't just walk along, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's good. Ugh. They don't do that, right? Patients will always tell you that something is going wrong long before they fall. They will slow down. They might get a little wobbly. They might put a hand to their head or their stomach or reach out to the wall for support. They might get pale or sweaty. They're going to give you some sort of sign that something is going very wrong. If you're not paying attention to the patient, you're not going to pick up on the sign, which means that it's going to appear we were just walking along fine. And the next thing I know, they're on the floor. That tells the nurse that you weren't paying attention to the patient, which is where your focus should have been. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what this skill is all about, is using proper body mechanics to make sure that your safety and the patient's safety is maintained, but also to make sure that when you're walking, that patient becomes your entire focus. You're not looking at obstacles. You're not looking at your phone. Nothing else, just the patient. So this care plan tells us to ambulate the resident at least 10 steps. So that's five in one direction, five back. It tells us to use a gate belt or transfer belt. It's the same thing. A gate belt and a transfer belt, same thing, two different names. Just like we have barriers and chucks, same thing, two different names, right? Privacy blanket, bath blanket, same thing, two different names. A uh, patient will be sitting in a chair at the side of the bed with shoes on. So we don't have to put their shoes on for this one. They'll already have their shoes on. Patient is able to walk, but needs assistance to stand. Now, let me explain to you a little bit about energy conservation, because that plays a huge part in this. So go back to page 43 for me. And we'll talk about energy conservation. We're going to learn a new principle with this particular skill. We're going to come back to she rules in a minute. I don't have energy conservation on here. Okay. All right. So have you ever seen an older person try to get out of a chair? It's kind of like the rock and roll method, right? First we walk, rock, <laughs> got to rock a few times, and then we try to roll up and we end up falling back, right? So the thing is, what makes this important is that there is a balance between effort and strength. The stronger I am, the less effort it takes, right? The weaker I am, the more effort it takes. Well, as we age, our muscles lose uh, strength. So that rocking helps build momentum. But the problem is that this whole thing takes a lot of effort, a lot of energy, right? Because it takes a lot of energy for me to rock and try to stand and fall back and do it a couple of times. Right? That took a lot of energy. Well, why do we care? <laughs> why do we care? Um, because energy is essential for life. Have you ever seen a two-year-old? I love two-year-olds. They're adorable. Two-year-olds are the best. 
But two-year-olds have a ton of energy. If you could bottle that energy, you'd make a fortune. You act, your energy level actually peaks out at around two. That is the most energy you will ever have. Yeah, so, and I'll prove it to you, right? Two-year-olds will bounce up and down for no reason. They, they don't have to ever. Now, if I win the lottery, I'm gonna bounce up and down, but anything short of that, I'm not bouncing, right? Because right. I just don't have the energy for it. I don't have energy to spare, but a two-year-old does. Let's go out just, just 10 years. Let's go out to 12. Now, 12-year-olds 12 still have tons of energy. They can run circles around me. They play video games all night, skateboard, play baseball, all those kinds of things. But you put that 12-year-old in charge of that two-year-old for one afternoon, who wins? Two-year-old. Every time. 12-year-old would be like, Mom, can't they take a nap? <laughs> right? I'm tired of playing with them. Right? So just in that 10-year period, your energy levels have fallen. They really do peak at two, right? 12-year-olds do not keep up with two-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Now go out to 22. Now 22-year-olds still tons of energy, right? You can shop till you drop and go out at night looking fabulous, right? But you don't have the same energy level you had when you were 12. Your energy levels have fallen. Go out to 42, <laughs> right? 42 year olds will shop till they drop, but that's at like three and we're not going out. <laughs> like my energy's gone. Go out to 62. Now, what do you think the energy levels are gonna be like at 62? There's a reason that we start looking at retirement in our 60s because there isn't enough energy to work all day, keep up with the house, cook and clean and take care of your social obligations and all of that you're running out of energy. We're probably putting our feet up for 10 minutes before we make dinner, those types of things. So if our energy levels peak at two and they fall after that, what do you think the energy level is gonna be like of our 82 year olds? Right, because remember the energy has fallen off, right? Now think about where you are in that graph. Okay, think about where you are. Have you ever tried to explain to a two-year-old why you don't have the energy level they do? Yeah, they don't get it. They don't get it because they have no frame of reference. They assume everybody has the exact same energy levels they do. And why wouldn't they? That's their whole experience, right? So, in this situation, you are the two-year-old. Your 82-year-old is gonna try to tell you, hey, honey, I don't have the energy for that. And you're gonna go, what do you mean? I do all the work. All you do is sit there. I'm showering you. What do you mean you don't have the energy? Well, in this case, you are the two-year-old. You're not listening. <laughs> They're telling you something and you're not hearing it. Okay, so be careful with that. If an 82 year old tells you, I don't have the energy for it, what do they mean? Yeah, I don't have the energy. You can't go to the store and buy, I don't care what Red Bull is trying to sell you. You cannot go to the store and buy energy, right? So this is an important uh, issue when we're working with patients. So let's think about that 82 year old for a minute, right? They only have this much energy to work with for the day. If you look at the graph, they only have this much energy. So why do we care? They're old. What do they got to do all day? So what kind of things do we do everything that takes energy? Walking. Okay, walking. <laughs> Talking, have you ever been too tired to talk? Yeah. If you've ever been too tired to do something, that means that something takes energy, right? So socialization takes energy. What else takes energy? Driving. Driving takes energy. Yeah, it takes a lot of focus and, and physical energy too. Okay. What else? Thinking. Okay, thinking. What about eating? Have you ever been too tired to eat? Okay. Have you ever been too tired to shower? Brush your teeth? Get dressed? Even things like breathing take energy. 
So it takes a certain amount of energy just to survive. And if this is all the energy we have on a specific day, and it takes energy just to survive, we've got to make sure that we're protecting our energy levels. Now, if we only have this much energy and it takes energy to survive, and when I try to get up out of a chair, I'm having to expel a lot of energy, right? Rocking back and forth, trying to get up, falling back, a lot of energy. What does that do to my energy levels for the day? Think about how many times we have to get up out of a chair. Okay, you got to get up out of bed. You got to get to the dining room to eat, sit down, you eat, you have to stand up. Then you have to go to the bathroom, you sit down, you go to the bathroom, you stand up. Then you have to go to activities. You sit down, you do an activity, you stand up. Then you have to go lay down for your morning nap. You get to bed, you lay down, you stand back up. Then you go to lunch, right? <laughs> so all day long, if every single one of those takes a lot of effort to sit down and stand up, if I'm expelling a lot of energy, I may not have energy at the end of the day when you come along and tell me, we need to get you in the shower. Well, why would you do that when you go back? Normally bathing and brushing their teeth and getting them dressed. And well, that's that's a, a very um, good way of looking at it. But some people prefer to shower at night. Okay. Yes. Some people prefer to shower at night. But also, when we're in a facility, it's not always practical to try to shower 60 people in the morning. So they're probably going to split it up on shifts, right? So although you're right, I mean, grooming should certainly be done in the mornings, but showering may actually be an afternoon activity. Now you also have to think about the patient's um, idiosyncrasies, what they like, what they don't like, that type of thing, their preferences, right? I am not a morning person. I don't like mornings. So I am trying to get to retirement so that I can sleep in. Now, do you think I'm going to want somebody to come in and wake me up at 4.30 in the morning when I have worked my entire life to get to a point I can sleep in? Right? So <laughs> we have to take preferences into account. So is this a um, morning shower person? Now, I do like my showers in the morning, but I don't want it at 5 a.m. So we have to look at preferences too, because preferences are dictated by the patient's innate energy levels. Some of you are morning people. You like to get up with the birds. You like to watch the sun come <laughs> up. You, you know, some people are morning people. That's just their natural. So they're going to have the majority of their energy in the morning. Some people are afternoon people. They kind of come alive around three or four o'clock, right? That's when they're most productive. Some people are night owls. They are most productive after 8 p.m. So that's when they do their house cleaning or get into activities or whatever. So we have to understand that these personality traits are ingrained, but they also affect the patient's energy levels. Does that make sense? Okay. So when we're talking about energy conservation, there's three things you have to take away from this. Number one, energy levels decrease as we age. Number two, patients won't have the same energy levels that you do. You have to be aware of that, but their energy levels are going to vary throughout the day based on their personality and their preferences. And number three, there are some things that we can do to help our patients conserve energy. Because what happens if I use up all of my energy today by four o'clock? If I'm 82, I've used up all of my energy by four o'clock. I have nothing left to give. Am I going to dinner tonight? No. I don't have the energy to eat. I don't have the energy to get there. So I'm going to stay in my room. That means that I am missing nutrition. So what do you think my energy levels are going to be like tomorrow? Lower. 
And this causes this downward spiral because we aren't conserving energy. We aren't maintaining nutrition. Therefore, tomorrow's levels will be lower. We won't eat very well. And this, this can cause what we a, a failure to thrive situation. So using tools and strategies to help our patients conserve energy is actually a very important part of what we do to maintain health. Okay, good. Make sense? Okay, so that's why we're going to use a gait belt to help this patient. If I use, remember there's a balance between effort and strength, right? So if I can use some of my strength to help offset the patient's weakness, they have to use less effort and it retains some energy for later, okay? So shoe rules is how we're going to, this is a whole, this is our last principle. We've learned all the rest of them. So this is it. This is the last one that we have to learn. Um, if the patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. We heard that with foot care. You guys remember that, right? We don't want to walk a patient in slipper socks because it's not safe and it's not hygienic. So slipper socks are not enough. We're going to use a gait belt to help this patient stand. Now that gait belt's going to go around the patient's waist. And then I'm going to use body mechanics to lift that patient up using the gait belt. Now, when you're using a gait belt, it needs to go around the patient's waist, not their chest, around their waist. And it's got to be snug enough that it's going to stay around the waist and not pull up underneath the arms or under the breasts and injure them. So it's got to be snug. In fact, we're going to check it with four fingers to make sure that it's snug enough. We only want to be able to fit four fingers between the belt and the patient. That's it. No more. Um, when you put the gait belt around the patient's waist, I'm going to show you on me just to, for demonstration, but remember that this is around the patient's waist. Okay, so this is a gait belt. It's just a flat canvas belt, has a metal buckle and a free end this flat canvas belt. It has a tag. Like every other article of clothing, the tag goes on the inside. Doesn't matter whether the buckle is on this side or the buckle is on this side, nobody cares. Just put it on, doesn't matter. But when you put the gate belt on, you wanna make sure that it's flat. So when you put this around the patient's waist, not yours, the patient's, when you put it around the patient's waist, you wanna make sure it's not twisted, it is flat. So if it's twisted like this, it could injure the patient or bruise them. So you want to make sure it's flat around the patient's waist. Now we want to put the free end through the first guard by the alligator teeth. So this is going to go right here, right between the first guard and the alligator teeth. And we want to pull it so that it's snug because you don't want it to go up underneath the breasts or the arms. So when you pull it, see how I can fit more than four fingers here? You want to pull it so that it's snug. So I can only fit four fingers between the belt and the patient. And then you're going to lock it in through the second guard and that keeps it from going anywhere. This tail hanging down might be in your way. If it is, just tuck it up in the belt. Gets it out of the way. To remove the gate belt, you unbuckle it and then you slide this metal um, bracket, slide it along the belt to remove. And then when don't pull it against the skin, listen to the sound. That can burn my skin. So you don't want to pull it against the skin. You want to reach around and grab the gate belt or loop it over the head. Okay. With the gate belt, okay, so let's say if somebody's in the shower, obviously they have no clothes on. That is a case by case basis that would have to be um, evaluated by the nurse that's caring for that patient. I don't recommend gate belts in the shower, no, because it's against bare skin and the risk of injury is pretty high. 
Yep. Um, if the patient is that unsteady, uh, maybe a shower isn't the best option. Um, shower chairs are always helpful. Um, but I wouldn't, me personally, I wouldn't recommend a gate belt in a shower situation. Yes, it's like a client that has dementia who they can't walk at all, but they recommend to have the same shower once. At least a shower or bath once a week. So if he has a chair, but helping him walk in his hospital bed to the shower where it automatically just picks all his energy as is. Yeah. So trying to get him up, mm -hmm. you have to use all your, his weight is more than my weight. So I'm like, right. <laughs> Yeah, I would probably work with the nurse on that just to find the best solution for that particular patient. Because it sounds like it's a challenge for sure. Um, and I don't want to give you suggestions because there's a lot of variables there that I don't know. And the suggestion I give you may be wrong for that particular client. Yeah, because my job is to get to the point where they just tell me tasks to do and that's end of it. The person has dementia, you got to get done with these tasks and that's it. That's all they mm. give me. So, I gotta go by ear. Like I'm in, I go blindsided then. <laughs> that's really about how it works. Yeah, I. That's not the way it's supposed to work. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I would, I would definitely ask your supervisor. Okay, how they want you to handle that. I think YouTube's frozen. Okay, so for this skill, we're going to talk about their shoes because remember when their feet hit the floor, we got to talk about their shoes. So we're going to say, I see your shoes on, your shoes fit appropriately, that type of thing. You're going to um, put the gate belt, make sure their feet are flat on the floor, put the gate belt around their waist, and then you're gonna use proper body mechanics to help them stand. Now I wanna talk about that for a second. If you look here, let me move the chair, and I'm going to see if I can. Okay. So if you look at this chair, do you see how there's a line beside the chair on each side? See these lines here, right? And there's a line in front of it. You can't really see because of the glare, but basically this chair is sitting in a box. You can literally draw a box around the chair. We're gonna use that box for body mechanics. That used to be when you were taught to lift somebody, we were told to stand in front of them, toe to toe, knee to knee. That's how we used to do it. But there's a physics principle here. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So let's say that I am standing in front of a patient. Let's say I've got a 150 pound patient sitting in this chair and I'm standing in front of the patient and I am lifting the patient up and pulling their whole body weight my way. That means 150 pounds of force is coming my way. My body has to counteract that. Remember, equal and opposite reaction. So my body has to counteract that. That puts 150 pounds of force on my lower back. It's not gonna take long before my back is gonna give out. So we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna lift a patient directly up toward us. So instead we're going to use a different, um, different type of body mechanics. So let me go here. So instead of standing directly in front of the patient right here, we're going to stand at an oblique angle. So one of my feet is going to go across in front of theirs, so perpendicular. That way their feet can't slide out. The other leg is going to go parallel to the chair. So I am at the corner of a chair with one foot along each side. Right. And then I'm going to bend at the knees, not at the waist. Grab the gate belt and on the count of three, one, two, three, I'm gonna stand up and that makes me way more steady and less likely to be swayed by the patient. Okay, good. Questions on that? 
Okay, so body mechanics is going to play a big part in this particular skill. You want to make sure the patient's feet are flat on the floor. Like I'm, I've got short legs. My feet don't reach the floor very well. They definitely don't sit flat on the floor. So I actually have to scoot forward in the chair for my feet to be flat on the floor. You want to make sure with your patient that their feet are flat on the floor before you start this or before you lift them up. So I'm going to show you this skill from beginning to end. We're gonna move that in our way. I need a volunteer to come sit in the chair. We're just gonna go for a brief 10 step walk. Volunteer, somebody. Okay, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. Good. Do you feel like going for a little walk? Well, if I said no. <laughs> what would I do if she said no? Okay, I'm going to try to find out why? why and then report that to the nurse. And then, like, come back later so I get them later. What if you say no? Who would we report it to? The nurse. The nurse. Okay, but yes, I will. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was wanting to see what happened. Okay. All right. So do you feel like going for a walk? Okay. Let me go close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. This is in my way. So I'm going to move it out of my way. Close curtain. Wash my hands. And get my gate belt. All right, Miss Jones, I see you have shoes on. Are they fastened well? Okay, and are your feet flat on the floor? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna put this gate belt around your waist. This will help me lift you to a standing position. So I have another quick question. What if they can't pass? Some old people can't bend down to their feet or can't even look and see that, that that hurts them. So technically you have to look for them to make sure. Okay, so them. remember I said that we have to follow the care plan, mm -hmm. right? So this care plan said the patient is sitting, able to do yeah, sitting right. in the chair at the side of the bed with shoes on. Mm -hmm. So I'm just acknowledging that they have shoes. Okay. The care plan may say that I need to put shoes on them, okay. but not for the test. Or like check to make sure they're fastened. Right, or on okay. appropriately. So we're going to bring this around so that it's snug. I only want to fit four fingers between the belt and the patient. Okay, and can you just kind of lean forward a little bit for me? There we go. All right, you're gonna put your hands on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna grab the back of the gate belt and on the count of three, we're gonna stand up. Once right. you stand up, I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to acclimate, okay? Right. Bring your feet together a little bit for me. I'm going to help you stand, but you're going to stand as All well. Right. Okay, so put your hands up here and on the count of three, one, mm -hmm. two, three. Feel okay? Mm -hmm. Are you dizzy at all? Nope. Okay. Let's go ahead and acclimate a minute. You're going to walk at your pace. We're going to go over to the white table, turn around and come back to the chair. Okay. So whenever you're ready, you can leave. Now, as she's walking, I'm going to walk slightly behind into one side. I'm holding the gate belt with an underhand grip and I'm watching my patient. So go ahead and turn around and you still feel okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk back. Okay. And when you get to the chair, turn around. And back up so the back of your knees hit that chair. Can you feel that chair behind you? Mm -hmm. You're going to put your hands back on my shoulders and I'm going to help you sit. One, two, three. There we go. Yeah, because a lot of people, a lot of my clients, oh, they wobble. Okay. Yes, they said they can get up and move, but they wobble. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> like, right. Like, but that's oh, why you have that gate belt. belt. But you don't hold it over. It's yeah, always I mean, under. Okay. Always under. So are you comfortable? Yeah. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you um, like a magazine before I go? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, call light is right here. I'm gonna put it right here on the bed. We'll pretend you, you're close enough to reach it. I'm going to put this back where I found it. Open the curtain, wash my hands, think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay. And remember that when you're working, the people aren't assembly line, right? So no two people are going to be exactly alike. Yes, you will have some people that are wobbly. Um, the nurse's responsibility is to find out if they're safe to walk or what other accommodations we need, right? That's the nurse's job. So that's why I keep saying to you, I know that you're bringing in real world um, yeah. scenarios. It's hard for me to give you direction because every person is different. So I can't give you the specifics you're looking for. That would have to come through your employer. Okay, good. Questions? All right, go ahead and take your break. Come back at, um, come back at 10 till. And then we have one more skill to go through today.
Okay, we'll just give them a couple more minutes to come in and then we'll get started because I want to make sure you guys have some practice time today. We're going to learn how to use the washcloth. That's why you guys all have washcloths. Okay, well, we'll get started and they can jump in when they get here. Um, so our care plan for this particular skill at the top of page 86. So we're at the top of page 86. Our care plan tells us to give the resident a partial bed bath. That means it's not a full bed bath. It is a partial bed bath and a back rub. Wash the resident's face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, and one arm and hand. So this is page 86 of your white book, your spiral book. <coughs> So partial bed bath for this patient, remember not all partial bed baths are gonna be exactly the same. For this patient, a partial bed bath is gonna include the face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, and one arm and hand. Do we care why we're not doing the other one? No, just this one. Yeah, it just this one <laughs> um, with soap and water. So we're gonna provide a brief back rub with lotion and we're gonna dress the resident in a hospital gown. Goes on to tell us patient is lying on back in center of bed and can roll as directed, but is too weak to assist with bathing. So the best way to remember this guy is face to waist, one arm and hand. Face to waist, front and back. We don't wanna use soap on the face though, because soap can get into the eyes and sting the eyes. It dries out the skin of the face. So just water on the face, but we're gonna use soap everywhere else. Okay, now there is a certain way that we're gonna do this. We've learned washing rules. We talked about it earlier. Basins are no soap zones, so we don't add soap to the water. We're gonna use paper towel to turn the faucet on. We're gonna check the water, it should feel warm. The patient's gonna check the water. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry, right? Um, don't get our surface wet. So we're gonna put a towel on the bed for this particular skill. And if we're gonna put lotion on, we're gonna uh, warm it up first and wipe off the excess. We've learned all of those things. But the one thing that we didn't cover was using the leaves method for body openings. So what is the leaves method? So if we're gonna wash anywhere that pathogens can get out or in, remember that uh, chain of infection we talked about, right? where pathogens have to have a doorway out and they have to have a doorway in. Those doorways can be natural body openings like your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your genitals, your rectal area. It can also be wounds, sores, rashes, or incisions. So if we're going to wash any normal body openings or artificial ones, then we have to have a way of helping prevent cross-contamination no worries. We have to have a way of preventing cross-contamination. So that's what we call the leaves method. So all of you have a washcloth in front of you. It's just a plain square white washcloth. Usually fold it in half and in half again. So it looks something like this. You probably have some of these hanging out in the linen closet at home, right? But instead of looking at it as a square, which is usually how we look at it, right? It's a square. Instead of looking at it as a square, I want you to look at it as a diamond. And if you hold it where the folded corner is in the palm of your hand and the free edges are at the top, and you tuck the side in by your pinky and the other side by your thumb. Okay. I know, everybody's like, what? 
what? So I'm gonna come around and help you. So you want the folded corner in the palm of your hand, your thumb here, and this goes there. Okay, so now you've got a cleaning surface. So not square, diamond. Okay, so thumb and pinky. And then you've got a cleaning surface. Yep, just like that. Okay. So, yep, we want the folded corner down here, just like that. So, hand, folded corner here, thumb, and pinky. There's your washing area. Okay. So, that keeps control of our washcloth so we don't have floppy corners. We don't want floppy corners, right? We want control of our washcloth. So if I'm holding this in my hand where my thumb is holding one side and my pinky is holding the other, I've got an area to, to wash with. If I wash a wet body opening, eyes, nose, mouth, genital, rectal area, wound, sore, rash, or incision, right? If I wipe any of that, I don't want to spread that anywhere else. So I can fold that down and that traps the contamination underneath. And now I have a new cleaning surface. So I can wipe something, fold that down, create a new cleaning surface. I can wipe something else, fold that down, create a new cleaning surface. I can wipe something else, fold that down. That's because you don't have the, you, yep, <laughs> there you go. Just like that. Very good. Very good. You want the, the folded corner at the bottom. So you have the leaves sticking up. This is why it's called the leaves method because we're using different leaves of the washcloth. But what this does is it allows us to use one washcloth in five different areas without cross contamination. So the way this works is we have leaf number one, we use and fold. Leaf number two, we use and fold. Leaf number three, we use and fold. Leaf number four, we use and fold. And the backside becomes leaf number five. Good? Pretty cool, right? I know, when, when I tell people we're gonna learn to use a washcloth, they're like, I already know, I already know how to use a washcloth, thanks. <laughs> But this comes in handy even when you have kids. Yeah. Right? Running notes, okay, let me wipe it here. I'll switch. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Instead of wiping boogers all over the face, which is what we used to do back in the day. <laughs> all right, so here are our important checkpoints for this particular skill. We're going to wash face to waist, front and back, and one arm. That's what our care plan tells us to wash. We'll wash the face first, no soap. We're gonna use the leaves method on the face because there's body openings there. Now the rest of the, bo the body, we don't need the leaves method. You can just, you know, washcloth is fine. You still wanna control floppy corners. Remember no floppy corners to control that washcloth, but we're only gonna use this leaves method when we're washing wet body openings. There's no need to flip leaves for anything else, okay? Um, we wanna control the washcloth. You want to support it, the arm at the elbow when lifting. We've heard that like 16 times today, right? Um, we want to replace the water if it becomes cold or soapy. Well, that just makes sense. Anybody want to be washed with cold water? Okay. Um, we're going to turn the patient on their side to wash, rinse, and dry the back. So when we turn them, where do they need to be? Middle of the bed. We're gonna give them a brief back rub with lotion and then we'll apply a clean gown. Now this patient is going to be uncovered and undressed. So what do we need? Privacy blanket. We're gonna be using supplies. Where are we gonna put them? Barrier. On a barrier. We're gonna be washing personal skin. So do we need gloves? Whatever we wash, we? Whatever we rinse, we? Dry. You don't wanna hold the linens up next to your uniform. If you take any extra, where do they go? Dirty linens. You guys know this. You know this skill. The only thing that you need to learn here 
is the washcloth. <laughs> that sounds bad, but yeah. This is the this is why I teach you the way that I do. So that when we get to this point in the program, you already know most of the steps to most of the skills. We're just going to repurpose them a little bit. Okay, good. Questions? All right. This is the longest skill that we do. If you look at the bottom of the page. Yeah. You have 19 minutes to get this done. 86, white book, white book, other book. No, white, white, page 86. All right, so when we do this test, are they going to give us money that has like a fake or a bridge? So if you look at the bottom of the page, it says mannequin. It says mannequin. Yep. It says yep. No, um, no curveballs. Just a mannequin. So you're going to wash the face first, no soap, dry the face. You're going to wash the whole front of the body, rinse the whole front of the body, dry the whole front of the body, one arm and hand. Turn them on their side, make sure they're in the middle of the bed. Wash the back, rinse the back, dry the back, put a little lotion in your hands, give them a little back rub. Now, a little back rub, we are not massage therapists. We aren't deep tissuing anything, right? We're just a little bit of lotion to reduce friction, up the back in small circles to the shoulders, come back down, let's do that three times. It's basically just to promote circulation and to make the patient feel a little better, okay? Anytime we put lotion on, we always wipe off the excess. We're gonna put a clean gown, clean body needs clean gown, right? Plus our care plan told us to put them in a clean gown, so that base is covered. Um, and you want to keep the patient as covered as possible during the skill to reduce unnecessary exposure. Right? Good. You already know this. This is not new, not rocket science, but it is a long skill. So for the test, if you get this skill, you get two super short skills to go with it, like respirations and range of motion. Okay, so two super short skills to go with this long one. Good? Questions? Questions? I'm going to show you the video for this because it has good close-ups. And then the rest of the class will be practice time for you. Okay? Any questions before I show you this skill? The nice thing is that you already know most of this skill, most of the steps involved. Now, remember you've got 19 minutes to get this done. Do you see how much time it takes me? And that includes the whole opening and closing credits, right? So it doesn't really take 19, but they're giving you way more time than you actually need. My name is Kat. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I need to do partial bed nap. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. For this skill, I'm going to need a barrier for the table. This will give me a clean place to put my clean supplies. For this skill, I will need four washcloths. Two towels, a clean gown, and a privacy blanket. Okay. 
It's a washing skill, so I will often need a basin, soap, and lotion. And I'll need a set of gloves. Ms. Jones, let me go get some water. I'll be right back. Ms. Jones, is this water appropriate temperature? Okay. And yes, you are going to have a mannequin blanket out over you. This will help the evaluator will actually feel the water. I'm going to spread the blanket without snapping or shaking the blanket. And I'm going to pull your sheet down to about your waist. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to sit forward for me in just a moment so I can untie your gown. And I'm going to spread this towel out underneath you to keep your sheets dry while we bathe you. Can I assist you to sit up, please? Thank you. I'm going to untie your gown and spread the towel out on the bed. Go ahead and lay back down, Ms. Jones. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to spread the towel out underneath your arm. <laughs> I'll remove the gown on the side closest to me, supporting the elbow as I lift it. And I'm going to relocate the gown to the other side of the patient. This leaves the patient uncovered underneath the side of the blanket for bathing. The blanket will keep you warm. Now I can apply my gloves. Take the first washcloth and wring it out. And I'm going to use four corners. We'll wash the face first. No soap on the face. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your eyes. I'll start with the closest eye to me. I'm going to wash from the inner to outer corner. Very gently. And then we'll fold this sleeve over to prevent contamination from spreading to the other eye. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your other eye now, inner to outer corner. We'll fold that leaf over, and then I'm going to wash the remainder of the face. Using very gentle strokes. And keeping control over the washcloth. We'll fold that leaf over and use the final washcloth for the nose. And then we'll set that aside. I'm going to take the towel and pat dry all areas of her face, making sure not to use too much water. We'll set the towel aside. We're going to take the second washcloth and wring it out. And we'll apply soap to the top of the neck. We do not need to use the leaves method because all of her skin from this point is intact. We're going to wash behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso. We're going to lift the blanket to protect privacy, but keep the patient covered while we wash down to the abdomen and up the side. Now for the exam, you are going to make sure the patient remains covered until the evaluator is asking to remove the blanket. At that point, you will just continue on. I am going to repeat these actions so that you can see what I have done. I'll remove the blanket for better visualization. Behind the ears, across the chin, the neck, the upper torso, around the breast, down the abdomen, and up the side. Then we'll clean down the front of the arm, the hand, up the back of the arm, lifting at the elbow, and the armpit last. 
Most chapters wash cloth aside because it has soap on it. We'll take the third wash cloth in the basin and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all the areas that we just washed. So behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, the abdomen, up the side, down the front of the arm, keeping the elbow supported on the bed. We'll rinse the hand, the back of the arm, and the armpit while supporting the arm. The red wash cloth can go back in the basin for later use. Now we're going to dry all of those areas. So we're going to pat dry or use short, soft strokes, but nothing vigorous. Go ahead and lift our the stones. We'll set the towel aside. Now the patient has a clean torso, so we'll place the clean gown on her. Jen, can you reach your arm through here? I'll help you put your gown on. We'll lift the arm at the elbow, supporting it as we lift. And we'll spread the gown out. Okay, Michelle, we're going to go around to the other side of the bed now, and we'll dress the other arm. Since the care plan said that we only needed to wash one arm, we do not need to cleanse this other arm. That's for the care plan, but we do need to dress it. So I'll remove the soiled gown, and we're going to place this in dirty linen. And then I'll put the new gown on. Michelle, can you reach through this arm hole? Thank you. And go ahead and lift. Thank you. Okay, now, John, I'm going to ask you to turn on to your left side now. This is going to allow me to wash her back and give you a brief back rub. I'm going to ask you to scoot toward me, and we're going on to your left side. <laughs> Ready? We're going to scoot toward me. One, two, three. Now, the evaluator will hold the mannequin in place while you complete your cleaning. I'm going to take the third washcloth, wring it out, and we'll soak the top loop. I'm going to wash the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. We'll set that washcloth aside. We'll take the final washcloth and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all of those areas. The back of the neck the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. And then finally, we'll dry all of those areas. Back of the neck, and the shoulders, the back down to the waist. Now our care plan asks us to give the patient a brief back rub. So we're going to use a little bit of lotion, making sure to warm the lotion in our hands before we give them a back rub. Ms. Jones, I'm going to give you a little back rub now. I'm going to start at the small of your back and work my way up in small circles to your shoulders. We'll do this three times. This is for circulation purposes. One, two, one more, and three. I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion. Now I can tie the patient down. And remove the towel that's protecting the linens. Ms. Jones, come on back onto your back, please, and scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you. I do not want to touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to her face for soiled gloves, but I need my soiled gloves to take care of all of my dirty linens. Ms. Jones, I'll be right back. These items are going to go into dirty linens. Now I'm going to go clean the basin. I'll empty the basin and rinse it. And then pick it up with a paper towel. I'll dry the inside with one paper towel. 
to throw it away. And then dry the outside with the paper towel and throw that away. And I'll get one for the board. I'll collect the soap and the lotion, placing them in the basin. It's from the basin to a store with storage. Paper towels can be thrown away. The barrier is going to be discarded. And now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to remove your privacy blanket now and pull your sheet back up. Are you comfortable? Going to roll the privacy blanket in a ball so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. This will be placed in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Such as magazines? No? Okay, here's the call line. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to open the privacy curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, any questions on that? It's actually not a hard skill. Just like you do. It's long, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's long. But it's not hard. Okay. Anything I can help anybody with? Anything you want me to explain or go over or review? All right. Well, this is the part that you get to play. So grab a partner. The best way to practice is honestly in groups of three, or if you're doing a mannequin skill, two and the mannequin. So one person is the patient, one person is the CNA, and the third person should have their skills book open to the page. And that way, if the CNA gets stuck, you can tell them the next step. And make sure that you're always doing the skill right. Okay? That's the best way to practice. All right, so I had a question on YouTube that I wanted to answer. Um, let's see here. Anna asks, bring this over here. Okay, on YouTube, Anna asked, um, under many videos about skills, there's an advertisement of persons who are helping to pass exams. Could you please explain what does this mean and is it legit and legal? Just curious. So, Anna, I can't um, endorse any person that is advertising on YouTube. I have no idea whether what they have is legit or legal. No idea. Um, so, to answer that, just um, use your due diligence. I know that the content I'm presenting is according to the state exam. I can't vouch for anybody else. So, kind of keep that in mind when you're, you're looking at those ads. Um, we are going to have, one of the things I'm working on now is the um, practice test game show that we're going to be doing on Tuesday. I'm writing the questions for that now. We're going to be putting all these questions on the website as well, so you can uh, access them in question form on the website as practice tests. That'll be coming up shortly. So I can't tell you about our resources. I can't really mention anybody else's. All right, so good morning to everybody that joined us. And uh, I see we've got people from Dubai and Senegal. Dubai, Dubai what? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, Rahima from Dubai. That's cool. We have uh, Valerie from Victoria, Senegal. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people joining. All right, so YouTube world, we're going to go ahead and sign off because the students in the classroom are going to be able to practice now, and I want them to be able to do that with the freedom of not having an audience. So we're going to sign off of YouTube now. Please make sure you join us tomorrow for the game show at 11 a.m. on our YouTube channel, and then Wednesday we'll be back in class at 9 a.m. Hope to see you there. Of course, we have our weekly live on Thursday as well. 
So lots of learning opportunities this week. All right, guys, until next time, happy caregiving.